guys, welcome back to my channel. If you're new here, I'm Kelsey. I'm the creator of Bite Size Ancient History and a recent graduate of Cambridge University. I don't know at what point in time I stopped saying that bit. I graduated in October, so I feel like within the year it's still recent. Aside from the point. So this video is part of my series that I've been doing for the whole of 2022 where I discuss our favourite films and TV shows and their historical inspiration, whether it's fact or fiction. And if you're a Marvel fan, it's very exciting that I've been doing every single episode of Moon Knight as it has been released. So don't forget to subscribe so that you don't miss out and turn on the bell icon. If you're generally interested in other fun historical content, don't forget to also check out my other social media channels. So today is episode four of Moon Knight, so we're officially over halfway through it now. And if you are a Marvel fan like me and you're a little bit of a nerd when it comes to it, you would have seen all the pre-interviews relating to this episode and the fact that there was a big twist coming and they did not disappoint. This is what I'm going to say now, if you haven't seen the episode yet, spoiler warnings ahead. But yeah, relating to the big spoiler part, I have had that song stuck in my head the entire week. It's just been going hippopotamus, hippopotamus over and over again. Like there's no other room for thought. But without further ado, let's get into it. Layla and Steve finally make their way to the dig site where they hope that they're going to find the Ushabti of Amit. To get down into this tomb, we see both characters having to put on harnesses and then like ropes their way. Is there a proper word for that? They use ropes to get down and there's also a lot of scaffolding on the tomb. And this is very accurate to what a dig site of this nature would look like. Because obviously, we are the first people to be entering these tombs for many thousands of years a lot of the time. So we have no idea how stable it's going to be. And the harness and pulley system, that's the word, is a good way of ensuring a level of protection and safety. Because a lot of the time there's going to be shafts that we don't know about within the tombs. And if you're not protected in some way, you could fall down that shaft and ultimately die so <laughs> it's very much needed and then the same idea with the scaffolding is that this is very very old we do not know how well built it was how sturdy it's going to be so we don't want it collapsing on our archaeologists once we get into the tomb we see the figures of two large seated lions and steve makes a joke about how he might be asked a riddle by this and this is a reference to the ancient idea of the Sphinx. So if you know anything about Greek theatre and Greek tragedies, you will have heard of the character Oedipus. In the play of Oedipus, he is asked a riddle by the Sphinx. And this is what this idea is referencing. However, in the episode, we do see them as just seated lions. Whereas in Greek mythology, they usually have the heads of women and then the bodies of a lion, and then occasionally also the wings of a bird. They were very vicious mythological creatures. Some believe that the name Sphinx actually comes from the Greek of meaning to titan, as in they would squeeze and kill their enemies. And because of this nature, they were often viewed as protectors. They would protect the entries to certain places, like in Oedipus, where it's the entry to Thebes and he has to answer the riddle. Unlike the Greek Sphinx, the Egyptian Sphinx generally had the head of a man instead of a woman, as we see with the most famous example. However, there have been studies recently to suggest that originally, the Sphinx was just a seated lion, and that it was a later pharaoh who carved his own face into it to harness this power of the lion. So I imagine the show could be referencing this. Once we get further into the tomb, we see this table where Steve draws the symbol of the Eye of Horus. He describes it as a royal symbol of protection, and in Egyptian mythology, that is very correct. So a massive tick there. In my previous video, which if you haven't seen it yet, I recommend you go check it out because I go into the mythology of this in a little bit more detail, we know about the Osiris mythology. And this is the idea that Osiris was the original king of Egypt as a god, and he was killed or murdered by his brother Seth, or Set. His son Horus then attempts to avenge him by battling Seth. In this battle, 
it gets very gory and Horace loses his eye. However, it is eventually healed by himself and other magical gods and then he presents it as an offering to Osiris. And this revivifies him in the fact that he can now live in the underworld as king, whereas before he was just simply dead. So this symbol is representative of that life-giving energy and of the royal protection. Steve goes on to then also say how each element of the Eye of Horus symbol has a meaning and represents one of the six senses. And many historians believe this to be fact. And I kind of also agree with them. Definitely some aspects are more convincing than others. So I'm gonna break it down very quickly. He talks about how the eyebrow is representative of thought, which they viewed as one of the senses. And this has pretty good logic behind it because if you're thinking or you imitate someone thinking, you often use this eyebrow action. So it makes sense that they pick up on that. Sight is then represented with the pupil. That one's pretty straightforward. Taste is then this little curl that we have below the eye. And you may think this is a little bit weird. However, that little curl is actually used as the hieroglyph for taste or tongue. So that makes complete sense. The section that is representative of your sense of smell then looks like a nose. So that makes a lot of sense. We then see the bottom bit representing this idea of touch, and we believe that this may be symbolic of a leg touching the ground. So I'll leave that up to your own interpretation, and if you think that is a viable answer. Finally, hearing is then the bit that points towards the ear from the eye. So, a bit dubious, but you can see the logic. Interesting, it also looks very similar to the part of the brain which is in charge of hearing. So that's quite cool if they actually thought that through, but obviously we have no proof that they would have dissected a brain in order to do this. Once Steve decides that the avatar of Amit would be the voice of Amit and we follow down that route, we find this preparation room and loads of depictions of what they recognise to be the car priests. And these were real ancient Egyptian priests. However, the depiction is dubious. Car priests were often the sons or close family members of the deceased, and it was their job to basically maintain the tomb and ensure that every day the deceased was receiving offerings, because without these offerings, their soul would not be nourished and they would not be able to continue to live in the afterlife. However, in the episode, they talk about how they have their masks and staffs as a uniform, and this isn't so true for the car priests. However, there was a group called the Sem Priests who often were accompanied by the Car Priests and they had similar duties in the fact that they had to make certain offerings and rituals towards the deceased or the gods in order to nourish and revive them each day. They would have these leopard print robes that we see in the depiction. The staff then is questionable, but we do see a lot of depictions with the Sem priests where they're carrying a tool which would be used in the ritual titled the opening of the mouth, which was this process of reviving and nourishing the spirit. The masks then have some backing. So we do have a lot of depictions where people are performing certain rites and they have a mask over the top of their head. A lot of the time it would be a mask of Anubis as they try and perform this role within the rite. It's often when they are mummifying an individual as an example. However, as archaeologists, we've never found these masks. We found masks that look like this, but they would have been much too heavy to have ever been worn in any practical respect. So we still don't know if they were actually used or if the drawings showing them wearing masks are more representative of them taking on this role than an actual thing they would wear. They also say how the car priests would have been entombed with the pharaoh. And unfortunately, this is not accurate. So as well, I'll get on to who is in this tomb a little bit later on, but they are much later in Egyptian history than when we would have actually seen pharaohs burying their servants and family with them. This really only happened twice in Egyptian history and it was at the very beginning because unsurprisingly they realised 
How do you continue to support a family dynasty if you're killing all of your servants and a lot of close members? Yeah. In this room, we also see a lot of canopic jars and dismembered body parts. I'm not going to go into too much detail with the canopic jars because I went and broke this down fully in my review of the 1999 Mummy movie. So if you are interested, I say that you should go and check that one out. Generally, this episode felt a lot like The Mummy, which I think is why it's become my new favourite. Like, it was, it was just such a good balance of, like, gore, action, and historical inspiration. I just thought, it's the kind of stuff that inspires people to go into Egyptology, and you have to love that. But as a brief overview, canopic jars were found in a lot of ancient Egyptian burials and they would store different organs within its respective jar in order to have it protected by that deity. As you'd often find the heads of these deities on the lid of the jar and then the sort of protective spells beneath it. After we have this altercation with a mummy, which is top notch, we learn whom the tomb belongs to. And I, when I tell you, I shrieked when he said it's in Macedonian. This is a big deal. As we know, this was the tomb of Alexander the Great. And this is a very, very real mystery where we still don't know where his tomb is today. So referencing this idea is very cool. And yes, so there is Macedonian on the sarcophagus, which a lot of people when over on TikTok, we've had this discussion. If you don't follow, you should. Macedonian and Greek script, very similar. The actual alphabet is the same and the grammar in generally very similar. There's a lot of debate as to if we'd actually be using Macedonian at this point in time, but we're not gonna go into detail there, but it is something you may come across as a side note. But basically it reveals, it says King Alexander, and it's very exciting. So the story, I felt like I got distracted there. The story of Alexander the Great. He is a very, very famous Macedonian general. He was the youngest person to have ever conquered the known world at that point in time, with a kingdom stretching from Macedon all the way to India at the very, very young age of his early 20s. Unfortunately, he dies in 323 BCE, and as a very young man still, he hasn't really set up a kind of dynasty yet. He does have a child, which hasn't even been born yet, and he hasn't decided who would take over as commander once he died. So when he dies, a lot of his followers try to lay claim to his body so that they can use it as their rightful claim to the throne. After many battles, many fights, it ends up going to Ptolemy I, and he, if you haven't heard of it, the Ptolemaic dynasty is over in Egypt. And this is where we're told that um, Alexander actually wanted his body as well. So Ptolemy takes his body over to Alexandria and it is buried here. And we know it's not buried here straight away, but for the sake of this simple narrative, yes. We know that it's there for a very long period of time with many sources telling us about different famous Roman generals and emperors visiting it. However, in about 400 CE, we have a source that tells us how they went to visit it and not even the local Egyptians knew where the body was. It's vanished completely disappeared and now there are many many conspiracy theories as to where it might be but we don't know. Um, some people have tried to look for it, specifically Schliemann once again which if you didn't see my earlier video on Troy you should because he is always an interesting archaeological figure to think about because his methods were very of the time, very chaotic and not effective so he tried to find, didn't work. They also said, we're not letting you look for him because he just destroys things. But where do you think it is? I think it'd be really interesting to share in the comments down below if you have any good theories on it. And generally this tomb is, there's so much I could talk about in this tomb. I could do a whole separate hour long video talking about its inspirations in Egyptology because it is so accurate in its depiction of what a tomb might look like. Specifically, it's very similar to the tomb of Ramesses V, which is in the Valley of the Kings, I think it's KV9, and also the tomb of Seti I, also in the Valley of the Kings. And it just takes inspiration from these two very well, alongside others, and it has very traditional depictions of the gods. We see this miniature army, and that's something they would take into the afterlife to protect them and still ensure their status. 
The actual depiction of the sarcophagus as well and the ones that we have later in the episode are just... They have the right deities on it, they have the right scripture, and it's... Oh my god. So if you want a separate video on that where I break it down into more detail, please let me know and I would absolutely love to do that. And I think that's all we're gonna have time for today. So thank you for watching and I'll see you next week. Bye!